Oh, there's this one. Cool. The Empress of Execution. What, you going after my heart? Are you going after my heart? Really? Execution? All right, let's see what you've got. It is my firm belief that each of us must accept the responsibility of bettering us. Hey. I ain't accepting no responsibility. However, what a speech. Change cannot occur Do you uh, have any idea what she just said? She's just saying if you don't wear a condom and she gets preggers, it's your fault. Level of Reading this actually made me think. What is the right way for a person to rule? Oh, 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 we can have discussions, but she strikes me as a lot more mature than a high school student. Like, what sort of high school student dresses like that? They don't. <laughs> and thinks like that. Most of the time they don't. I'm gonna guess you come from a wealthy aristocratic family, possibly tied with big corporate or politics. Too much kindness and you'll be seen as weak. Sometimes a ruler needs to be harsh. A ruler is responsible for the lives of many others. Is it difficult for someone like that to find happiness like everyone else? C'est magnifique! Excuse me. Ah, Le France. Monsieur Chef de Cuisine? Oh, vous voulez beaucoup de chèvres avec moi? Chef de Cuisine? Talking to me? Your ramen is absolutely wonderful. It's been a while since I last gave my compliments to the chef. What do you use for the bouillon? Bouillon. He's like, the what? What the hell is that? So she's a French aristocrat. Did her family survive the guillotine? Or are they post-guillotine, France? I mean, it fits the bill. How much you want to bet the Count of Monte Cristo is probably one of her favorite pieces of literature? <laughs> probably also, uh, what's it called? Um, the Princess's Bride, you know, the one where he's like dueling. Uh, I've, got a, I've got the swords right there. I'll, I'll fence with you, not a problem. I've got no problem with fencing. I find it quite fun, actually. Um, anyways, okay. Okay, this is gonna be interesting. This is gonna be interesting. This is gonna be interesting. I mean, yeah. Hutchin wants to go to France. I, I don't care about going to France. I mean, France is on fire right now. But I am very interested. Okay, so, she, so she's probably the exchange student. Which, and if she chose Japan specifically for exchange, she must have some sort of cultural interest in Japan because usually if you're from Europe and you're going on exchange if you're not interested in the country you would typically go to a place like Britain Australia or the US um, because why not I mean we ended up getting a lot of you know old money foreign exchange students uh, in our university and when I mean old money I mean freaking old money you know Old, old money. You know, like, they used to own castles old money. It's just insane how rich some kids are. And they don't even realize that they're rich. <laughs> they don't even realize that they're rich. They think it's normal. And it's like, that ain't normal. I'll show you normal. <laughs> I'll show you how the other side... I'll, I'll, I'll show you how these peasants live. Uh, Monte Cristo, whenever I hear that, I can't stop being reminded that Comeda art style is used... For a servant in the Fate series. How did we go from Monte Cristo to Danganronpa to Fate? I, like, that is one heck of a leap. I don't understand. That is a big leap. That's a big leap. And I've played Danganronpa, right? So, the fact that I don't even see how the leap is taking place, I'm a little bit like, what's going on? She could have been a Japanese native that likes French culture or have mixed heritage. I think the fact that she has red hair, which is incredibly rare in Japan, uh, considering that black hair and brown eyes are virtually everywhere, which are both recessive genes, which typically, through just sheer probability, if you have someone in your genetic pool that has black hair and brown eyes, they will usually show up more than, you know, green eyes, blue eyes, blonde hair, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I don't think think she's a French native um she could be half you know like a relative or a trader or someone like that because Japan used to do trading 
uh, back in the day with, you know, like ships and everything. And then they kind of closed themselves off to the world. Uh, then they opened themselves up to the world again. And then they wanted to modernize. Um, and then, you know, like, you know, they got rid of the samurai while they did that. Nice work, Japan, you bastards. Um, and, <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, you know how that went, right? You know how history went. She speaks French and has a Japanese last name, and it's possible she's half Japanese. Kirijo. I mean, that would probably mean that it's possible that her dad is Japanese, or she could be adopted. Uh, in a few days, we should be having the last trailer in theory. I mean, maybe, maybe. I'll show you how my people feast. Orders exclusively ramen, P&J. See, I fell in love with Japanese food in a food court. Like, Chinatown, food court, $8 karaage don with soup and salad. Like, the dirt cheap in a food court. And it was delicious. I mean, it did kind of help that the girl that was serving the food was very cute. But, like, I fell in love with Japanese food. I, I went there almost every day. <laughs> I just loved it. And then I just started eating all these other foods and everything. So, yes, uh, for someone that's grown up with a European palate, and, you know, if you're an aristocrat, you're eating very rich European foods, uh, the contrast of Japanese food is like comparing butter to wine. Very different in more ways than one. Very, very different cuisine. Different flavors, different aroma, different texture. So different. Um, to the point that it's very easy to fall in love with it. And, you know, French cuisine, and mind you, I'm no connoisseur. I've only had like French a handful of times. There's a lot of butter in the cooking. There's a lot of butter. And when you look at something like ramen... Uh, and a lot of Japanese dishes, they don't actually use a lot of butter. If at all. Like, they don't use butter. They use other ingredients. And so, she's going from this European cuisine to a Japanese cuisine where they use the broth and, you know, like the bone, the marrow. It takes like 20 to 24 hours to get that good tonkotsu ramen. With the thinly cut pork slices and the ramen noodles vastly different from what you're going to get in Europe. And then she's just like, whoa! What the hell is this? Because it's a big bowl of soup and noodles and meat, but it's not heavy. When you eat European food, there's a lot of heaviness from the oil, the butter, you know, the ingredients. They're kind of heavy. You'll eat it and you'll feel like, oh, I'm getting full, you know, like I'm kind of... I'm getting full, I'm getting slouchy, I need a coffee. You eat the Japanese food. It's big, but it's light. And you're like, whoa, I just ate this whole thing. I'm feeling nice and warm and full, but like, I can still move. I don't feel like I need to take a nap. It's very different. It's a very different feeling. Um, it's kind of why I fell in love with Japanese food. It's, it's just like so different. Like I grew up uh, eating Serbian cuisine. So, like, I'm very familiar with it. Uh, effectively, like, you could take me to one of the best Serbian restaurants in Serbia, and I've probably grown up eating similar food to that, because I grew up eating traditionally made with traditional ingredients, you know, like, passed down through the generations, like, cooked properly, like, top-tier cooking. Um, I mean, that's, like, one of the things my dad actually picked, a girl that could cook, right? Uh, so, I grew up with that, and it is so different to that when you start eating food from Southeast Asia, particularly Japan. Very, very different. Very, very different. Very nice, too. Very addictive. Very addictive, uh, as you can see. You're making me miss sushi. No one will go there with me anymore because the bowls are small but expensive and I'm the only one that gets full on two bowls. That started happening here. We had like a sushi place called Sushi Hub um, and they were like the premium sushi. So if you like you wanted sushi, you'd go to a cheap place and you'll buy like a sushi roll for 150 and Sushi Hub used to sell them for two twenty, like a salmon avocado sushi roll. But they were always fresh. So the rice was good, the salmon was raw, the avocado was good. So you know you buy it for two twenty. Um it went up to two fifty. It's like, alright, you know, two for five dollars, we'll live with it. Two for five fifty, like, okay. 
Now they were selling them one for four eighty. One sushi roll, one small sushi roll. You know, shit that I can make at home, right? They're closing down their stores around Sydney. They're just not getting the sales. Too expensive for what it is. Way too expensive. And they were dominating. They expanded like crazy. And they're like, ha ha ha, we expanded. Let's increase the price. Bam, they lost their customer base. Greedy bastards. Um, but Hutchin makes amazing sushi. What I do is I go to the expensive suburbs in Sydney. So if you in Sydney, if you go to the seafood market, you can get seafood, right? If you go to the expensive suburbs, you can buy seafood at the seafood store that's fresher than the seafood at the seafood market because the best cuts go to the expensive suburbs. The leftovers go to the seafood market and the shit goes to the supermarket. It's, it's, it's fucked up. And so you go to the expensive suburbs, you go to a random like seafood store and you buy sashimi, right? And it's not expensive either. It's like $60 a kilo. So I buy a kilo of sashimi, I get home, grab my knife, you know, Japanese style, get the skin off. I love the skin, you know, cook it with a little bit of virgin olive oil. You cut the sashimi slices. Achan, sushi, let's do it. You know, half of it sashimi slices, you know, the ones that look really nice. The less good looking pieces of the salmon, Hachan turns into sushi. Bam! We've got sashimi, sushi, and cooked salmon skin. Delicious. Delicious. So, you know. Um, yeah. Food. Food is the spice of life. Like, if you... Pe people tell me, I eat for function. And I'm like, what's the point of living? <laughs> what's the point? I'm, I, I, can't, I kind of save myself for Japan. Uh, when I was here without Hutchin, I don't eat Japanese food in Australia. I save myself for Japan. And so when I go to Japan, I'm going to eat. I'm not going to count the plates. I'm not going to count the calories. I don't give a shit, right? I get fat, I get fat, right? I'm going to eat to my heart's content. I'm going to gorge myself. And I'm going to come back to Australia and not see Japanese food until I go back to Japan. Hachin, on the other hand, loves, you know, like she misses Japanese food and all that. She, she's a foodie. She's a foodie. Um, but, like, she always kind of wants a little bit of Japanese food. She wants some sushi with someone, some of this. Like, it's okay. But I'm, like, looking at the prices. I'm like... Why don't you buy the stuff that you can't make at home or can't have when you're back in Japan? Like, I won't mind paying for French cuisine. It's expensive in Sydney, but I don't mind. We can't cook it and we haven't been to France. And going to France is going to cost you thousands of dollars in a plane ticket. So, like, French food, Italian food, German food, you know, Spanish food, like, all of the food. Get it, right? But if we go to Japan every year... And we make Japanese food at home that's better than what you're getting from this store. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why do you do this to me? But clearly, Hachan, you know, grew up in a household that, um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to say they were like well off, but she grew up in a household where, you know, she could eat nice food, right? Whereas I know what it's like to not have food. <laughs> so I appreciate it. So I love food in more ways than one. I love food, but I never waste food. I always, I always, I always eat everything on my plate. Even when I don't like it, I will always finish it. Always. Hutchins is like, ah, I don't like this. And I'm like, <laughs> I just like, I'm not eating capsicum. I'm like, okay. It's like, oh, I'm not eating this. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not eating the skin on this. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Hutchin, you're being a little picky here, but like, okay. What's your approach for all-you-can-eat buffets? There's this buffet in Japan uh, called World Buffet. I think it's called World Buffet, yeah. It's $10. It's it's 1,000 yen. And they've got cuisine from about 50, 60 different countries. Now, I understand the logic of buffets. They'll try to fill you up on carbs. Avoid the carbs. Don't mix cold food with hot food. They'll contract your stomach. Now, what I do before a buffet is I have a diet cola, either Pepsi or Coke, doesn't matter which. About 30 minutes before I eat, I drink the diet cola, it goes in my body. My body thinks, here come the calories, it fires the insulin, and then my body is primed. And because there's insulin in my belly, uh, it's already like, oh crap, there's no food, we have an insulin imbalance. And then I go to a buffet, and then I just eat a crap ton. A crap. 
I can eat more than a kilo of meat. Easily. Like, for lunch, I'll just go buy a barbecue chicken. And I will demolish that barbecue chicken. Like, I will eat that whole chicken. That chicken is gone. So, if I'm going to a buffet or something, I will go for the foods that I like. But, most probably the foods that I can't get elsewhere. So, like, all you can eat barbecues for me, awesome. Uh, sashimi and, like, seafood and that, awesome. They're making no money on me. They're making no money on me. And Hachong can eat the same amount. Not the same amount of meat. Uh, her body can't eat as much meat. But she could definitely eat uh, seafood, carbs. Like, she's a carb monster. She will eat noodles, like, an insane amount. Like, she will eat pasta. She'll eat, you know, like, Thai food, Pad Thai, uh, Pad Siu. Like, she will eat noodles, stuff that's cooked with carbs and vegetables and stuff. She will, like, eat me under the table. Meat, densely packed proteins and fats, I will just, like, demolish. So she could eat as much sushi as I can because of the rice. But sashimi, I'll probably end up eating more. Chicken, like the leg, breast, the wings. The chicken. Like, the whole chicken. <laughs> All of the chicken. Like, a literal barbecue chicken. The whole chicken, I eat. I will eat it. I won't eat the bones, but like, all the meat on the chicken, it's gone. And it's gone. Like, if I'm nice, I, I will separate the breast, dice it up, and give some to Cheeky. But she's a princess. And uh, if she has too much chicken breast, she gets runny poop. You know, like, I gave her a little bit last night, because, you know, Hachan's out of the house. Cheeky and me are kind of, like, bonding. I spoil her a little bit when mommy's not around. Um, and uh, today, she pooped, like, six times. <laughs> she had to poop six times today. <laughs> It goes through. She wouldn't survive in the wild. She would not survive in the wild. She is a princess dog. She is a princess dog. No way she would survive in the wild. <laughs> huh. uh, what was this? Was that all you can eat sushi or a uh, beef bowl place you mentioned before in front of the restaurant with some kind of challenge? Yeah, so there was this uh, sushi train place. And they had this, like, promotion where if you eat, you know, 15 plates or less, you pay full price for the plates. If you eat between 15 to 20 plates, you get, like, a discount. You know, you, you pay, like, 180 per plate. Uh, if you eat, I think it was between 20 to 25, you pay 150 per plate. And if you eat, like, above 25, you pay, like, 120 for a plate or something, right? And so I went there with Hachan, and, you know, like, it's a good deal, right? Like, it's a good deal. You eat a crap ton... And per plate, like, it's cheap. Because most people will go there, oh, I can eat. They'll lose and they'll end up paying more because they thought that we were going to get a bargain, right? And so we ate there, we had fun. I brought our friend the next time. Um, because when I was eating there, I kind of ate a few plates for Hachon so she could unlock the cheap price. But like, anyway. And I went there with a mate and we just demolished the place. We ate 35 plates each. 35. 35. And then at the end of it, when we were done, the guy's like, oh, can we take a photo? And we're like, yeah, cool, why not? Because we like, had this massive mountain of plates, like something you see Goku and Vegeta doing in Dragon Ball Z. And, you know, they took the photo. I'm like, yeah, sure, can we have a copy? He's like, oh, we'll post it on our Facebook group. I'm like, oh, that's nice. And they gave us like these certificates. I'm like, what's this? And it's like, oh, you qualify for the next round of the uh, eating tournament, like the eating challenge. And I'm like, what? It's like, yeah, this is like where you qualify for the eating challenge. Like, if you can eat 30 plates, you qualify. And I'm like, we just came here for dinner. <laughs> I am a fat man. I'm fat man. Trust me, I am fat as fuck. Like, when I go to a all-you-can-eat Japanese barbecue place in Japan, they're like, oh no! Shirokuma! You just see the owner start crying. There go my profits. <laughs> Did you participate in the extra challenge? COVID happened, so unfortunately not. My doggo gets only biscuits at home and some doggo treats specifically good for doggos because he has always been really sensitive with food. Well, I always make sure the food that I feed uh, Cheeky is, you know, something that you could feed to a dog. The problem is she's probably a princess dog because probably her mummy and daddy were also princess dogs. 
So her entire genetic makeup is probably really sheltered dogs that have never slept outside. They've always had clean water, clean food, you know, from the can and all that crap. Like, I give her a little bit of carrot, which is fine for a dog. She gets diarrhea. <laughs> like, a little bit of carbs. She's gone. Uh, real princess dog. Real princess dog. The kuma has entered the restaurant. People look at me when I'm eating in a Japanese restaurant. I'm just demolishing the place. Like, I, I kind of feel awkward because Hachin will introduce me to her friends. And we'll always go to like a barbecue place or something like that. And they'll finish eating. And probably for the next 40 minutes, I'm still eating. I feel so bad for them. And they're just looking at me. And, and, and after a while, they just like stop looking at me. And I'm still eating. I'm like an animal that escaped the zoo. <laughs> I'm giving white people a reputation in Japan. By how much I eat. Same thing when I go to the gym. Because in her hometown, I'm the only white person there. I'm the, I've been surrounded by school children that are looking at me like I'm something from outer space, right? Like 30 kids surrounding me. I'm like, shit, are they about to jump me? Anakin, where are you? You know? Um, and so, like, I go to the gym or something, and I'm a big boy, right? And you've got these people to go to the gym, and they're like shredded, and they're like, yeah, six pack. I just go there to lift weights, and they just look at me like. <laughs> I'm a big boy, alright? I'm a big boy. <laughs> 